So anytime a machinist introduces a end mill to the cut, we lead in to the cut, make our perimeter, and then lead off the part. Generally, this minimizes the step, uh, but there, there's still some amount of step. We can go to better tooling, a more rigid machine, better tool holders, and bring that step value down. But at the end of the day, it's just a matter of how fine that step is. Uh, you know, it's always going to be there. Uh, I, for the most part, have industrial customers who, if they get a little bit of a lead-in step like that one, it doesn't offend them. Most of the time there's some bead blast operation or heat treat that's going to make it go away. But I do have a few customers who sell a very high-end product with minimal post-finishing or post-machining finishing operations. And they, they really care about tool pads and they want very clean looking parts. So instead of having a visible lead in lead out, they want something like this where it's just a clean surface. And, uh, most of the time, I have enough tricks up my sleeve as a machinist to get that for them, but sometimes the best way to handle it is at the design level, and uh, we're going to go over a few of those tips today. So, taking a look at the cam for the part I just showed, we do the bulk of the finishing with a 2D contour pass around the outside. Um, and what I want you to pay attention to is where we're leading in on this one, and how. So I'm going to slow it down. So as it's leading this way, the table's driving towards the end mill. And then it starts, swoops in and starts its path around. And then when it gets near the end, the last motion it gets before it gets on that final face, the table's driving in the opposite way. It's driving away from the operator. And then it swoops around and cuts. So that means... Any amount of error in the ball screw, ball nut, any backlash is going to show up at that lead-in, lead-out transition. Uh, whatever backlash amount is going to show up as a step. That does not come across in cam. It just leaves a nice, flawless surface. But reality is, even really good machines have, you know, some measurable amount of backlash. That's why there's comp tables. So over here, what I do instead, the preferred method when I handle something like this, is I'll put the lead-in point at the corner, right on this uh, fillet tangent point. And that way, you can't see it. Um, so, you know, that's where it would be, and you really can't tell. It's just otherwise a very smooth, smooth corner. Now, we have situations, though, like we have to come in and finish this little step. All of a sudden, we don't have a corner to hide it on. We just have to uh, lead in and lead out right on this flat. And uh, unfortunately, there's not much you could do about it. It's just going to leave some kind of step. And we can see that barely. You can just see how the light's catching. So another thing that was done with the exact same end mill that did the outside. As end mills are cutting, when they're cutting the full length, they're deflecting a certain amount. Again, good machines, good holders, that's going to vary. But when you come down to, like, say, the bottom third then and cut, it's deflecting less. So same tool, same machine, it's going to be into the material a bit more when you're using less of the flute. And so that makes blending a, uh, a step like this, the two faces, that makes it challenging. So armed, armed with the, the lead-in, lead-out issue, the deflection issue, um, what do we do? And the answer is just try not to design that situation if you're really concerned about aesthetics. Um, instead, you know, can we, can we make some sort of cutout here? Can we put like a large enough chamfer that meets on that ledge? Um, you know, is there any way we can hide, hide where that cutter is going to come in and come out? Um, the, the other place we see this is uh, like on this standoff section here. Most of the face here was cut when the 2D contour happened. But we see we just have a little sliver of material right here. So we'll need an additional operation to come around and remove that. Um, and that's going to leave a little bit of a step. Uh, 
Again, most customers, it's a non-issue. But what you can do is instead of having this little, little flat that needs addressed, you could put a bigger uh, radii on it, radius on it so it comes all the way to the corner there. Um, now all of a sudden, you get a really nice blend and because you're not trying to match two flat surfaces to one another. You're, you're, you're blending on a corner. So that's, that's the uh, lead in and lead out in question. Boy, that's really not gonna show up. There it is. Okay. And then this is the other one, which we can see is just really nice and smooth all the way to the corner. So I'll try to figure out a better way to show that. Uh, all right, so we have, we have identified the problem, which is trying to blend two faces together with the same tool. Uh, and the solution is just trying to, try to give yourself a sharp line from the top of the part to the bottom. Anytime you have a jog connecting a surface from the top to the bottom, that's going to be a face blend, and those don't always come out so great. Um, so let's look at uh, another example of this. So that's everything in the same orientation, like same operation in the machine even. Uh, an another problem you have is when you have like this ear here and you have to address it from two sides. So, you know, we do our 2D contour. We would blend it uh, the first side. While we're back here, we'll cut in this slot and then we flip. When we flip, we have to cut it from this side now, but anytime you flip a part over, whether it's in a three axis mill and you're going from one vise to a second vise, or it's in a five axis mill and it's flipping 180 degrees, there's gonna be some kinematic error. Uh, and that's gonna show up when you try to blend this corner. So uh, same situation we looked at on that standoff, there's a small amount of flat that we have to blend to this larger flat surface. Um, and it's just not gonna look super great. Whereas if we were to bring this fillet so it matches up with the tangent point of the ear, all of a sudden it blends really well. Now, back to those slots we cut earlier. The reason we cut them from the back side is because this embossment here would make the tool much too long and so, Cutting them from the back side just made everything easier. Problem is when we flip to this side and blend, uh, again, any kinematic error from vice to vice or flipping it in a five axis mill is gonna mean that this face of the slot doesn't meet this face of the embossment. Um, and so you're really better off putting an intentional step between those two features. Uh, anytime you share a face like that, that spans across not only two operations, but two orientations, it's gonna have a, a bad mismatch. So um, the, uh, the end mill, when we go through there, it really has to poke out the bottom a little bit, like 10 to 20 thou. And uh, when, we, when we come back through then and finish that wall, uh, there will be a little mismatch between where that slot got cut and the wall got cut. And maybe it's stock heavy, maybe it's dug in, hard to say. Um, but if it's something you're concerned about the aesthetics of, no, that's a situation um, to avoid. Uh, and I want to go over micro features in blending. This is something I see a lot on inserts where you have one little tiny part feature which demands a micro cutter, but you have it blended into a much larger surface. So I have two options I could approach it. I could take a bigger end mill and uh, face all the way uh, up near it and then come in with my micro end mill and try to get the two blended and hope I get a nice step free surface there. Um, that's usually going to involve a process of leaving stock, cut, measure, adjust. Sometimes it's easier to just face the entire thing with the small end mill. This particular part's kind of on the margins. It's big enough in the 
facing it with the entire small end mill uh, could be a problem because by the time I got done facing it, the tip wear could be enough that we're leaving floor stock. So, um, yeah, that's just not a fun situation when you're trying to blend face features like that in and floor finish really matters because uh, you can't, it's very difficult to get in there and and polish so uh, it's probably going to be used as machined um, and so you really need good finishes and anytime you're introducing blending and good finishing uh, <laughs> it gets very frustrating so finally I want to talk about turned features and blending milled features so I see I see this shape a lot like some kind of shaft with uh, protrusion uh, that's very very common for me for some reason uh, and so uh, the way this might work is you have like a Swiss lathe or live tool lathe and it turns the shaft transfers it to its sub spindle and then gripped in the sub spindle a end mill is introduced and the C axis of the sub spindle in conjunction with the X axis of the lathe make the, the shape you know the X axis is moving the C axis is rotating uh, and you hog off all that stock and you end up with something like that. Uh, reality is there's, it's not going to be that smooth surface. It's going to have a step in it like this. Uh, either the shaft or the milled feature, one will be bigger than the other. So that's if it's doing it in a lathe. Um, now, lathes of all variety, they, they have the kinematic issue of when the subspindle gets hot, it grows uh, how it's mounted to the frame. And that tends to move the part away from the cutter sometimes. Or if the ball screw that's moving the turret with the live tool uh, gets warm, it can move the cutter away from the, the part or, the, or towards it. Uh, and so that creates a situation where through the day that size is slowly moving. Better the lathe, more, more thermally managed, the less that's a problem. But... Uh, so it could get to a point where, you know, there's enough of a step, a few tenths step, that whatever whatever passageway that's going in, you know, have a sharp corner that's dragging. Um, other option is you're making these in a mill, and uh, you're standing it up, and you've found the center of the shaft, that's your work coordinate, and now you're milling around it. So mills, as they heat up, the spindle gets quite warm and the connecting casting that mounts the spindle to the z-axis it could be 12 to you know however many inches long 20 as that gets warm it grows and it's moving the spindle away from the z-axis rails and so heat is causing a direct shift in the y-axis at least on this kinematic layout and so you can end up with a situation where through the day your concentricity is slowly getting worse from your milled feature to the shaft you're gripping. So uh, that's uh, also a bad scenario. This is of course exaggerated for effect, but um, that's that's what you're dealing with sometimes. And that's going to catch up in whatever you're putting it in if you have a close enough fit. Um, so something you could do as a designer is make it intentionally smaller uh, and rely on the corner radius of the end mill that you're using to leave a little bit of a fillet there. And now you, you don't really have to worry about any kind of blends. Um, so it makes it a lot easier to machine. It's not going to snag. You can open up your tolerances. Uh, whereas if you have it designed like this, where it's the same surface essentially, um, that's going to be a problem. The other way place you see this is on uh, splines. So you have the, the spline cut section kind of matching into this diameter here. And so like this part might get turned, the chamfer's turned, and then the major diameter turned. And then you'd come in and use maybe a spline cutter or a ball mill and put these uh, rib cutouts in. And getting them blended to this front part of the shaft, it's, it's going to be a chore, um, at least getting it blended well. And so with turn parts, there's not only the blending of the size 
like on the mill that's an issue. It's usually a uh, difference in uh, surface finish texture. So like a, a turned part is essentially a very fine pitch thread, just a, a line that's wrapped all the way down the part as it's spinning. And um, a, a milled surface is usually a series of scallops. Um, so the, the philosophical differences in that surface texture make it so it's very hard to blend the two. Even, even if size-wise there isn't much of a step, it's going to really uh, throw light differently and catch your eye as being a mismatch. So sometimes the best approach if you're doing cosmetic turned parts that have milled features is to have an intentional step difference like on these splines here, like this, you wouldn't have any issues of blending the spline to the turn work. So, uh, yeah, be aware of blends. Um, you don't really want to have to blend multiple tools together. Uh, even blending the same tool on different tool paths can be challenging, but you especially don't want to blend different machining operations together on the same surface. That's, uh, that's really asking for kind of a rough looking part. Um, most of the time, most of my customers are perfectly happy if they get a part like this and there's like a slight lead in, you know, if that just so happens to be, they're not offended. Uh, you know, like I said, bead blast, uh, tumbling, most of that will take it out. Um, this, this really applies to high end parts, but, uh, yeah, sometimes you, you, have those customers and you need to know how to deal with it uh, and if you're designing for those customers you can get them parts that are manufactured the way they want with less hassle so thanks for watching